Christopher. Here you are. Welcome in St. Gallen. The stage is yours. Vielen Dank. Uh, can you make good turn? Yeah, da hinten. Funktioniert das? Um, leider, um, uh, Entschuldigung, uh, am Anfang, uh, vielen Dank für die Einladung hier uh, zu sprechen. Es freut mich sehr, uh, beim uh, Tipo St. Gallen zu sein. Uh, leider muss ich meinen uh, Vortrag auf Englisch uh, machen. Mein Deutsch ist nicht uh, gut genug für äh, so lange zu sprechen. Der äh, Roland hat mir gesagt, dass ich ein paar Worte auf Deutsch äh, sprechen soll, weil das äh, charmant war. <lacht> Aber ich bin nicht sicher, ob ich wirklich charmant sein möchte. Äh, und deshalb äh, spreche ich weiter auf Englisch, das ist sicher nicht äh, charmant. So, uh, we continue with the Dutch theme, uh, the work of uh, Gerard Unger, who you see here on the screen. And uh, when I saw the, the theme of this conference, uh, Balance, um, it seemed to me that his work in typeface design fitted perfectly uh, with this theme. Uh, if we think of great typeface designers from the second half of the 20th century, early 21st century. Four names come easily to my mind, at least. Matthew Carter, Adrian Frutiger, Gerard Unger, and Hermann Zapf. Gerard Unger was the youngest uh, of these, and unlike the others, he didn't design any typefaces for metal type. So he began at the very beginning of the uh, photo setting uh, era. So uh, photo setting and then later digital uh, type. Uh, so his career is really a case study in the development of uh, modern uh, techniques of typesetting and typeface design. And uh, in a sense, he was a, a very Dutch uh, type designer, worked in a particular Dutch tradition, uh, which uh, was called the Dutch taste. Uh, this was something that was identified and described several hundred years ago by the French typographer, uh, Pierre Fournier. And he uh, described Dutch typefaces from the uh, mid to late 17th century as le goût hollandois. And he didn't mean this in a positive sense. He said that um, the Dutch uh, were much more interested in commerce than art. And so they made these typefaces that were quite narrow and uh, a bit mean looking so that they could get more text into the page. Um, but I think it's also it can be seen in a very uh, positive uh, way, uh, this tradition. and. Uh, Gerard Unger certainly worked uh, in this tradition in trying to uh, make economical typefaces uh, that didn't take up too much room, but that were also very legible. And that's the balance he tried to uh, make in his work. Um, it seems to me he had, a, in a way, a characteristically Dutch face, um, but also a very individual uh, character in his face, and this is the same in his type faces, which are always seem very Dutch, but also have his individual style uh, imprinted on them. He had a very distinctive uh, style in typeface design. But I don't think we should emphasize the Dutchness too much. He was a real European, and he had a, an interest in uh, all the cultures uh, of Europe. Uh, and he was quite a Francophile, and this is something he inherited from his father, and particularly his father's uh, library. Uh, his father was a subscriber to this uh, famous uh, journal, French journal, Alzé Métier Graphique, uh, and uh, Gerard Unger remembers that as a, a teenager, he uh, 
spent hours looking at this particular issue from 1948, which was full of uh, all kinds of different lettering and type. Uh, and he used it so much that it fell apart uh, completely. Uh, and he owned uh, this copy uh, until uh, it stayed in his library for his whole life. And so uh, he developed uh, an interest in letters and type quite early on uh, as, a, as, a, as a teenager. And he was also inspired by uh, a famous Dutch example, uh, the work of Jan van Krimpen, uh, who designed these famous uh, numeral, standard numeral stamps, uh, which were uh, known to everybody uh, in the 1960s. Um, and uh, Gerard Unger uh, saw an exhibition of uh, Van Krimpen's stamped designs and typeface designs in the uh, library in Arnhem, uh, where, he, uh, where Gerard grew up uh, as a young man. And uh, he was fascinated by these very precise drawings, but he said, uh, it encouraged me because uh, I could see that all you needed uh, was a sharp pencil and you were in business. Uh, so. Uh, it inspired him also to become a type designer. And in particular, this uh, typeface uh, designed by Jan van Krimpen, which is really uh, his least characteristic type design called Sheldon, which was designed for typesetting Bibles, uh, has an extremely large X type or uh, very short extenders. Uh, was a great inspiration to uh, Gerard Unger. And what you see here is in that there's a very strong horizontal emphasis to the letters. So when the, where the curves come from the stems of the letters, there's hardly any upstroke. They, they come out almost horizontally. This was a, a feature that Gerard Unger made his own and was convinced uh, made typefaces more legible. But it didn't only come from uh, this Dutch tradition. It's also to be found in the work of a, another typeface designer who was very important for Gerard Unger, the American designer, William Addison Dwiggins. And you see a, a drawing on the left from Dwiggins' typeface from the 1930s, Electra. Uh, and you see, in a sense, the same uh, shape being made where the pointer just happens to be uh, there. Um, in, the, um, in the equivalent letter on the right, which is Gerard Unger's um, first major typeface, uh, Demos. So here, uh, it's, it's extremely similar here. This is Gerard's uh, typeface, Demos, from... Uh, 1974-75. So, uh, to go back a little bit, um, this is Gerard Unger's uh, student identity card uh, from the Kunstneiverheid School, the uh, Applied Art School in Amsterdam from the mid-1960s, uh, which a few years later became the um, Herod Rietveld Academy, which it still is uh, today. And when he was a, a student there, uh, he told me that uh, he, his teachers, there were two um, factions or two tribes of teachers, let's say, a strong modernist uh, faction, traditional modernists, uh, and some uh, classicist uh, tendency also, and uh, he was, he felt like he was forced to choose between them. He either had to be a modernist or a classicist, and he didn't want to choose. He wanted to take something from both of them, uh, which is another way I think uh, his work exemplifies a kind of balance, in that he wanted to find a, a middle big uh, between uh, modernism and classicism. Uh, this is a, a self-portrait he drew of himself uh, as a student there in the form of a, a fictional map of his brain, which is rather nice, I think.
And even then, as a student, in his first year uh, at the uh, Applied Arts School, uh, he decided he wanted to design a typeface. He was the only one of his colleagues who, who did this, and that uh, on the top is his student typeface design uh, from his first year of study. And um, underneath you see his final year project. So in his third year of study, he uh, also designed a typeface which was intended uh, for cutting uh, signs in plastic, uh, which is a theme he came back to later. So he was uh, convinced he wanted to be a typeface designer, although that wasn't really an available option as a, a career path. Uh, in those days. But luckily, um, direct from graduating from the uh, Applied Arts School in Amsterdam, uh, he contacted uh, Wim Kraul, who was then uh, already a famous um, graphic designer uh, at uh, Total Design in Amsterdam. And um, there was already some... Uh, publicity about this famous new alphabet that uh, Crowell had designed. It hadn't yet been published, uh, but people uh, knew about it, and it was causing some fuss, and Gerard decided to uh, call him up and ask if he could show him his work, which he did, and uh, Vin Crowell invited him to, to work with him as his assistant, uh, which Gerard did uh, for six months. Uh, and during that time, um, Bim Crowell, who uh, sounds like a very generous man, uh, uh, encouraged Gerard to make a, a counter proposal to uh, this alphabet, which uh, Crowell always said wasn't really intended to be a usable alphabet. It was to excite um, discussion. And so he encouraged this discussion, and uh, in the same series of square publications, in the same year, 1967, a counter-proposal was published by Gerard Unger, only four pages, uh, handwritten and typewritten. And uh, this was what was inside, uh, trying to uh, design more traditional letter forms to fit with the, the technology that uh, Crowell was uh, talking about, which was the cathode ray uh, typesetter, cathode ray tube typesetter, the first generation of digital typesetting machines which broke letters, smooth outlines into pixels. And so the, uh, the text that Gerard wrote on the right there in English is very interesting um, because he was 25 years old, fresh from the academy, and it's, it seems like he really knew or had uh, confidence that uh, he was going to be a type designer. Uh, so, and he was daring enough to contradict uh, his mentor, Crowell, and say he, he said, saw there no reason to develop a new alphabet. And uh, he says that uh, in the second paragraph, machines have been designed by uh, technicians to achieve a fast composing speed. This was their concern. Letters are my concern which is a very precocious thing to say for someone uh, who had no real prospect of becoming a type designer uh, at this stage. And indeed, later, Wim Crowell uh, commented that Gerard had turned his idea into usable, readable uh, letter forms, which uh, Crowell's original proposal had not been. But... Uh, Gerard uh, wanted to try other things. He only worked with Wim Crowell for six months and then decided to go and work in advertising uh, because he'd only heard bad things about advertising from his teachers and decided to see if it was so bad. And he worked at a, an advertising agency in uh, Amsterdam called Prad, uh, which had a, a connection in London with uh, the London Press Exchange, where he was sent for several months, as you see here, in 1968. Uh, to learn to become a type director, whatever that means. You have to wear a suit, obviously, to be a, a type director. Uh, but 
the, the full-time job he had in advertising was downgraded to a part-time job, and then he got two other part-time jobs uh, almost immediately. One was teaching at the academy where he'd only graduated a few years earlier, the Rietfeld Academy, teaching in the evening classes, which he did uh, for another uh, 35 years or more. And um, he also got a part-time job at the Enschede Type Foundry in Harlem in the Netherlands, um, which didn't last long. But while he was there, he um, proposed this type design, which was really his first published type design, and connects with his student project to design a, a sans serif for cutting in uh, plastic signs. And this was called Marqueur. And uh, all, all the time, uh, in his uh, spare time, uh, he was developing ideas for new typefaces and sending them to companies like Monotype and uh, Dutch Type Foundries, trying to uh, see if they were interested in publishing, which they weren't. This is just one of them called uh, Reader, which was uh, based on a uh, new century school book. And also, uh, in the early 70s, uh, he was doing a lot of research about the new uh, typesetting techniques, technologies of uh, cathode ray tube typesetting, the, the first generation of, of digital typesetters. And as part of this, he um, started going to the RTP congresses. Uh, and uh, this shows a picture of the A-Type-I, uh, or RTP, a working seminar in Basel in 1974. And here you see uh, some people you may recognize. Um, on the right talking is uh, Armin Hoffmann. Uh, next to him is uh, Hans Edward Meyer. Then Gerard. The man in the glasses, I don't know. Next is Helmut Schmidt. And then is our friend uh, Jost Pochul. Richtig. <laughs> If anyone knows who the man in glasses is, I'd be, be glad to know. It looks like he doesn't really belong there with his uh, papers under his arm. He's just walking by. So the, these congresses were very important uh, for Gerard. Something else interesting that happened around the same time, 1973, uh, he joined with a, a, a student colleague of his, uh, Paul Mike Sennar, who became a very famous information designer, and they formed a, a consultancy called Sign Design, uh, which never really got anywhere or did any significant work. But uh, they had an idea uh, to uh, make a pitch for signing for the new uh, Pompidou uh, Center building, the, the Beaubourg uh, Center in Paris, which was still then in construction in the early to mid-70s. And uh, Gerard went to Paris, and he talked with the architect, Richard Rogers, but told me afterwards that he didn't understand what uh, Rogers was talking about uh, in terms of this building. And uh, the Dutch uh, pitch wasn't successful. They didn't get the job. Uh, but the designs that Gerard made seem to me very interesting. It, it, there's this theme which comes up again and again in his work about isolating segments of letters, breaking them down into components. So here was an idea to, uh, to have the components of the letters uh, assembling and disassembling themselves, which would have been better than the actual signage that was originally uh, made for the Centre Pompidou. So this is 1973, 74. And around the same time, the other thing that uh, Unger and Mike Sennar were asked to consult on was a new signing system for the Amsterdam Metro, including a new typeface and a new uh, design for the illuminated signs. And uh, Gerard uh, designed this typeface, uh, which is called uh, MOL, or M-O-L, uh, for the uh, Metro system. And uh, because he knew that the, the letters would be backlit, so they would be um, 
very bright, shining through a dark uh, background, he, had the, uh, he knew or he sensed that the edges of the letters, any sharp parts of the letters, will be rounded off by this effect of halation of the light. And so he des decided to make the letters round uh, in any case, so uh, as to control uh, the way that happened. Uh, and you know, this drawing, in a way, looks very dated, rounded type, 1970s. Uh, but I think it was very effective on the actual signs. Uh, and here you see some of the last ones that survived, uh, luckily in a station with a very long name, uh, Waterloo Plain. Um, and they were taken down only a few weeks before Gerald Unger died, uh, almost exactly a year today. Uh, he died in November 2018. And these signs have just been taken down. And there's now a different system in place. But it, it remained in place in, uh, from about 1977 in parts uh, up until then. Uh, but in the meantime, uh, Gerard Unger wanted to design types for these new um, typesetting machines, these new digital typesetting machines. And having done lots of research and reading about the technology, he thought he was ready. And he uh, proposed a design to the manufacturer uh, of the first uh, CRT composing machine, the firm of Rudolf Hell, uh, in, based in Kiel in Germany. And he took a train there, and he, he made a presentation of this typeface, which would become uh, the typeface called Demos. And uh, these are cards from his uh, initial presentation. Uh, which must have been very persuasive because he got uh, a commission to, for the typeface to be produced. And he kept uh, the box in which uh, he made his presentation. He made a nice little box with uh, cards and overlays. And here he is uh, giving the presentation to me in uh, 2016, uh, as he originally had. I should have said at the beginning that um, in the last uh, two or three years of Gerald Unger's life, I, I um, was, was researching and writing a book about him, which I hope will be published soon. And I had privileged access to his archive at his house and was able to discuss his work with him at great length over some very good food uh, as well. But the thing is that, you know, even though he was designing letters for uh, digital typesetting, he knew they would be broken up into pixels. He hadn't really fully understood that. And after his presentation had been accepted, he was handed this grid. He said, now this is what you need to draw your letters on. And it was still a shock to him uh, that he had to do that. And so he, ha he felt he had to completely rethink the way he was designing letters, not from the outside in, not from the smooth outlines, but somehow from the inside out. So he, because uh, you couldn't rely on the quality of the outline of the letter, he had to um, think about the, the heart of the letter. And so he made extensive trials of how he could render curves well uh, with this pixelated technology. Uh, and uh, he's put across by the one he thinks works uh, the best. And also here you see um, his proposals for how he wanted the serifs to appear in um, in Stufe, should be Stufe 1, 2 and 3, I think, uh, because the, the Hell composing machine had different designs, different master designs for three different size ranges. So he had to make drawings for the whole typeface three times over uh, in different resolutions. And so Stufe 3 was the highest resolution so you could make better curves. So this is the kind of detail, detail he went into. Um, he could have supplied nice outline drawings to Hell, and they would have scanned them, and that would have been it. But he wanted to control the every pixel uh, on the the form of the letter. So he decided he had to draw the pixels himself. And 
And these are trials for uh, designing in, in this new way. Uh, I asked him what this was about, uh, this colorful exercise. He said, I was trying to see if there was any structure that could be uh, discovered between these pixels, but there wasn't. He said, I'm not sure. But, uh. And so these are the kind of proofs uh, he would get. And uh, so he would mark the, the pixels that needed taking away in red, ones to be added in green. You can see that remarkably when the, the, the Hell uh, machine, uh, typesetting machine, made an italic, it actually slanted the whole grid. Uh, and so the, the letters were um, mapped onto it in that way. And so here you see on the left, the, these are the final drawings that uh, Gerard would send to the type foundry. So he would draw very carefully uh, pixelated letters because he wanted to control the exact form that came out of the other end. It was a, a matter of quality control for him. And these are uh, the first two typefaces that he designed for uh, the hell typesetting machine, which uh, we have a bad um, view of early digital typesetting from the mid-1970s, that the quality was bad. But it wasn't always the case, because this uh, typesetting machine, the Hell CRT, was really uh, a very high quality uh, typesetter. And uh, you can see that in this output from the 1970s. So high resolution, pixelated output, then printed. Uh, and this, this is the demos and praxis types, which are uh, the related serif and sans serif types that uh, Gerard designed, which was actually quite an original idea uh, in the mid-1970s. I don't think there had really been a related family of serif and sans serif types up to that point. It's very common now. Uh, but I think he was really the first to do it, although he gave them different names. And then came a, a third typeface in a kind of a loose family, which was even more original, uh, which was based on a kind of what he called modern calligraphy that he'd been developing since around 1970 using a felt tip pen, so not with a broad uh, cut pen, which means that uh, he used to argue a lot with the uh, famous uh, Dutch calligrapher Hedet Nordsai, uh, who hated uh, what Gerard was doing. Uh, with felt tip pens. Uh, and this, he, this was combined with a, an idea to how to program a computer to actually draw letters intelligently. Uh, so th he was dreaming, really. This was before the first uh, outline uh, digitization uh, software was, was invented. But he got very heavily into this idea of how to mathematically uh, encode curves. Uh, but what came out of this was, was a more traditional uh, typeface based on this um, calligraphy that he had been practicing. And here you see some early versions of it. But still, uh, because he knew that there were these such strong restrictions in terms of the actual uh, output technology uh, of the typesetting machine, he felt he couldn't really make uh, the shapes he wanted. They had to, he had to make it more upright because uh, slightly uh, diagonal strokes were problematic. Um, so it took years for this to be produced uh, from his early sketches until the mid-1980s, trying to work out how to produce this uh, weird kind of letter form, which is a, an almost upright cursive sans serif. I don't think there had ever been uh, a typeface like this one before. And unlike uh, almost all of his other types, which have this characteristic I explained at the beginning, where there's this very horizontal emphasis that there's almost no upstroke. Uh, 
uh, of uh, in calligraphic terms. Here, there is an extremely strong upstroke. You know, it comes right from the bottom of the stem. So it's a real anomaly in terms of his uh, type design work. And this typeface uh, went on to be called uh, Flora, named after uh, his first daughter, uh, who was born in 1983. And the typeface was released uh, a year afterwards. And there's a, a strong influence of this typeface on the italics of typefaces like Lucida and uh, Thesis, for example. And, and at this time, he was invited to, to give an exhibition about the, uh, the work he was doing uh, at the uh, in, in Amsterdam at the uh, Stedelijk Museum. And he, it's a very interesting exhibition, the, the, the panels still survive, and he developed this kind of alternative theory of writing uh, in a conceptual sense, whether done with a, uh, a pen or by a machine, because all of the techniques that he was using seemed to have in common that the, they produced a, uh, a uniform dot or pixel uh, or a line uh, which could be moved in a certain direction. So it was a kind of alternative theory to writing uh, that his contemporary uh, head at Nordsai was developing around the same time. Much more uh, dependent on the technology being used, uh, which was always a strong concern of uh, Gerard Unger to, to make the best of the technology being used. But after all these uh, battles with new technology and with low resolution uh, digital typesetting, he could see, uh, as you can see from um, this drawing here, which is obviously for the Icarus system of digitization, so which was then very new um, in 1980, of encoding the outlines uh, of um, letters um, and storing those instead of st storing the letters as bitmaps, which is what he had been doing uh, previously. You can see this uh, coming and so he decided to do something more elegant and more humanist. He wanted to make something more beautiful and not just grapple with the problems presented. And so um, this shows a sketch of uh, he's making over the famous uh, Janssen types uh, by Nicholas Kisch, uh, which are a famous example of this Dutch taste in uh, type. Uh, and this is the typeface uh, that came out of that, um, called Hollander, a uh, very elegant typeface. It's not really in this uh, 17th century tradition of the Dutch taste. It's much wider and seems to be filtered through the work of Jan van Krimpen. But still, this was a kind of transitional period, and what Gerard was still involved in doing was making uh, pixelated drawings of letters. And what he would do, he's posing for this photograph, but this is what he would do, uh, draw pixelated letters. And then he would stand back uh, with a, a reducing glass and squint uh, to, to mimic a uh, reduction of the type to print size. And uh, he called this glass his minifier, not his magnifier, but his minifier. That was his way of proofing uh, the type. But from the, this typeface, Hollander uh, developed what's probably his most famous uh, typeface called Swift, um, a much sharper and dynamic version of, of this uh, type. And this shows a very early version of it where only a few letters were produced and used to typeset uh, a specimen. And because Gerard Unger was designing it to be used in newspapers, this was always a strong interest of his, to make a, a typeface that would print well in newspapers, which still in those days uh, were relatively badly printed. Type suffered in newspaper printing. 
And so he had a, an advertisement uh, set in a, a Dutch newspaper, uh, and he told me that um, the editor insisted that it had this title, this is a proof of a new typeface design, because the text is kind of gobbledygook, uh, unzin. Um, it could have been a coded message from the Russians or something like that. So they had to say that it wasn't. Um, so this was a way of uh, proofing the, the type in the re in real situation he intended it for. Um, and the, here he's uh, showing uh, some of the wonderful large-scale drawings that he made uh, for this typeface, which sometimes have about 10 layers of paper stuck on the mixture of photocopies and hand drawing. And then this will be followed by hundreds, if not thousands, of uh, carefully drawn outlines for Icarus digitization, all done freehand uh, by Gerard. He never used any uh, French curves or plastic templates. Everything was freehand. He was a real master craftsman. And this uh, part of the inspiration for this typeface, Swift, was from the bird, uh, the Swift. Uh, he, he loved these birds and the, the way they darted through the sky. And this was a print he made uh, to illustrate um, that inspiration. And on the right, you see uh, the typeface as it was printed in the Dutch uh, newspaper uh, Parol uh, in the yeah, late 1980s, I think. And you can see that uh, back then, the technology of newspaper printing meant that all the sharp parts of Swift, which we know are there, begin to be rounded and uh, destroyed to a certain extent. And it, uh, Gerard said that he, he made, he wanted to make the serifs of this typeface so big that newspaper printing couldn't destroy them. Uh, that was the idea. So all these types I've been showing you so far were designed for this one company, the, the Hell, the firm of Hell in Germany. And um, then in the 1980s, with the so-called democratization of digital uh, type uh, technology um, and the postscript era, uh, other uh, companies became involved in making digital uh, type. Uh, one of them in America was Bitstream, uh, which was uh, co-founded by Matthew Carter. And they asked uh, Gerard Unger to de design a new original typeface for them uh, instead of uh, Optima, which was then a very popular typeface and they were having great trouble making a nice version of Optima. And so Gerard designed uh, this typeface. Uh, the, the first version of it you see on the left uh, from 1983, this is a typeface that went on to be called Amerigo, uh, is more of a monoline sans serif. But then he had this great idea of, of um, introducing this very strong uh, contrast where the, the strokes thin down to almost nothing. Uh, where they meet the stems. And here you see uh, what I was trying to explain at the beginning uh, about this, the horizontality of the, the curves, that this curve doesn't go up at all before it comes down. It goes straight down underneath. You see he's even painted out the bit that was there before. Uh, and it, it al also almost breaks here. Uh, there's almost a fracture. So it seems to me there's an, an element or some inspiration from fracture type. There's something almost gothic about these Roman type designs. And I asked Gerard if there was uh, some conscious connection to fracture type. And he said no, that there wasn't. Not conscious on his part uh, in any case. But I think there's something from this Dutch tradition uh, that feeds into that. And the, these are uh, several versions of this Amerigo typeface uh, in development, which is a really a very stripped down, very pure expression of this Gerard Unger style of type. Uh, and in a way, the type, another type he was designing around the same time for the uh, Dutch 
printer manufacturer, Orsi, uh, called Oranda, uh, was a, an exaggeration of his personal style, where he uh, blew up uh, the serifs to become uh, almost slab-like. But um, the nice thing about these uh, proofs and these corrections for that typeface, Orlando, which was also made with Bitstream in America, uh, is something I thought of when the, uh, thinking about balance. Because although many of his typefaces are very similar to each other, uh, they all seem like versions or variations on a theme, uh, that can sometimes uh, make us ignore the great craft and attention to the design that's behind them. So in balancing the relative weights of strokes so that the whole thing seems harmonious. And that's the spirit of these corrections that he was making uh, by hand here uh, with the very uh, nice comments like, careful here. And these are some other uh, versions of, of uh, Orlando. Um, in the previous lecture, we saw some examples of uh, this typeface, Argo, uh, which Gerald's holding the drawing for here, which was a, a sans serif version of his Swift typeface, effectively taking out the serifs, altering it slightly. It, it, it happened very fast. It was relatively easy for him to design. And it was used uh, alongside Swift in uh, the shorter Oxford English Dictionary here, uh, and he was very proud of that. All, all the time, he was uh, still uh, working with very strong restrictions on uh, technical restrictions. For instance, here, designing a type for uh, screen displays for Philips with a really uh, coarse uh, grid, still problem solving. I mean, he considered his job uh, in type design really to be a problem solver. But uh, he, he wanted to do something completely the opposite of that. And this took him to uh, the beloved uh, Dutch tradition of chocolate letters. As you may know, on St. Nicholas Day, uh, chunky chocolate letters are given uh, as a present. Uh, and he decided he wanted to design some chocolate numbers simply because there had never been uh, chocolate numbers. Here you see him with some chocolate molds on the wall behind him. This was the early 90s. Um, apart from type design itself, um, he did a lot of lettering for very public uh, commissions, such as commemorative coins in the Netherlands. Um, and uh, the <laughs> I don't have a clock here. I don't know. What's the time? <laughs> uh, and this led to a, a kind of deconstructivist typeface uh, he did for this uh, avant-garde project, Fuse, uh, which was really about the most radical type uh, design for that project. He also did uh, more... Uh, designs for Dutch coinage, in fact designed the last uh, round of Dutch guilders before the uh, euro was introduced. I'll just skip through some of the pictures here of another one of his most famous typefaces uh, called Gulliver, which was designed specifically for newspapers and um, economical typesetters, uh, and was in fact the first typeface that he uh, marketed and sold himself. He was one of the first type designers, in a way, to have their own uh, foundry. Uh, and this is uh, Gulliver in use uh, here, very badly typeset in USA Today, uh, where it was the standard type from around 2000. Gerard designed this typeface to be almost indestructible, but the Americans really tried their best uh, to destroy it. <laughs> here. He didn't mind. Um, he also became a kind of the Dutch national type designer uh, in designing a new typeface or redesigning the old typeface for uh, Dutch road signs. Uh, 
in the early 90s. Uh, also uh, was asked to design a type for, to, to make signs to commemorate the millennium 2000 in the city of Rome, which was, however, not implemented, uh, but led to another great typeface uh, of his called Capitolium. So uh, with that, I'm being asked to finish. <laughs> I have lots of nice pictures, so I'll... Uh... <laughs> okay. Thank you very much.